One. What is up, Wolfpack? It's your boy, the Wolf of Roto Street, here with your Thursday Week 12 Daily Fantasy Draft Kings preview. As always, we're doing these on Thursday to preview the main slate tournament focus, not looking really at cash games. We're not trying to just double up my money here. We're trying to win the big one, the Millie Maker. Uh, so we're going to focus on the main slate of games, the 1 to 4 o'clock on Sunday. And um, I've joined, not as always, because the last couple weeks I've gone solo, because I've been doing fucking crazy ass shit after school and whatnot but Jimbo Slice is back for the first time in a few weeks Jimbo how's everything going my man going great uh I think we've done pretty well for ourselves the last few weeks so you know gotta keep that momentum going absolutely I, I did have a, a tough week I took it on the chin a little bit this week uh two weeks ago I, I won 500 bones in a tournament I uh, was real pumped about it, thought I had finally cracked the code. In fact, I was only two players. I know I sent it to you away from a $50,000 payday from winning uh, the blindside single entry. I was right there, and uh, if only I had swapped in Christian Kirk instead of Robbie Anderson. I'm a complete moron, tried to just not eat chalk, and, and ended up paying dearly oh. for it. Uh, 500 bucks. still took it. Thought I was the man, put up half of it last week, and did not see any of it come back. So we're going to get back on the saddle, though. Time to get going. And this, this slate's really interesting. I've been looking through it. There's usually like some clear cut, lock them into my lineup no matter what style of guys. And to me this week, in terms of studs, in terms of middle, like it's, I find myself hovering more to the middle range of the pack rather than, you know, studs and duds, which is what I usually do. Um, so, so I'm very intrigued to hear what type of picks you have as we run down as always. We're going to go position by position, starting with the expensive guys. We're going to pay up for the middle range guys and then those low cost boom plays. Probably the most important part of any lineup is saving the money, but not, uh, saving on points, getting the points from those cheap guys. Um, so you ready to dive into this week 12 slate, Jimbo? Absolutely. Uh, let's get into it. Um, and, and real quick, too, I actually, before we dive into this, I did today, uh, real productive day at work, look at all 11 millionaire makers so far. I know I sent you that document right before we started. I'm going to dig in a little more in terms of how many had stacks between quarterbacks, wide receivers, how many stacked games, which I know is a very popular strategy for anyone new out there or, or just kind of getting their DFS feet wet. Game stacks are essentially where you try to predict the flow of a game. Let's say, I think, you know, for this week, a sample would be, I think Tennessee is going to run it down the throat of the Jaguars, getting an early lead, in which case Nick Foles in that Jaguars passing attack is going to have to make up ground later in the game. So stacking that game flow, I might have Derrick Henry at running back, which I do, and then I might have DJ Chark at wide receiver, maybe even stacking him, uh, quarterback wide receiver stack with Nick Foles at 5,400. That's actually what my lineup has right now, so I'm giving you an example of what I use. That's a game stack, though, where you, you predict the flow um, and try to match it up, and oftentimes you'll see that in the winning lineup. Uh, multiple players, three, four, five on the two teams uh, facing off with each other. So we'll keep that in mind. We'll talk about some spreads and whatnot as we're going through this too. Uh, but I always start with horses, running backs. In those millionaire maker lineups, six out of those 11 lineups had three running backs. So the flex was running back, whereas five had wide receivers. I actually was kind of surprised. I thought all, almost all of them would have running backs. That's generally what I do is a three running back stack. But I, I might look at different types of lineups. If I'm sticking to tradition, though, I'm going to start with my most expensive guys. Jimbo, who are you paying up for at running back this week? Uh, there's one guy who I know you're a big fan of. I, I also really like him. But I'll pivot to a guy in a similar area, uh, Nick Chubb. Mm. You know, he's, I feel like he's not going to be as high-owned. Um, I know there's a lot of love for Kareem Hunt this week. But the workload that Chubb's getting is pretty ridiculous. 20-plus um, 20 carry, 20 carries in, I think, five or six straight games. Uh, every time he touches the ball, he's a beast. The only problem is that he's not falling into the end zone. For some reason, their goal line offense is just putrid. Um, you know, when you get a home game against Miami, uh, home favorite, positive game script, this could be a 20 carry, 100 plus yard, maybe one to two touchdowns. I think a lot of people are maybe going to pivot off Chubb, but he his floor is pretty high, but I feel like his ceiling is exponentially high this week. I think that's a really good point because a lot of people are pivoting away now that Hunt's back and they share the backfield a lot and Hunt's kind of monopolizing the receiving. When you think of DraftKings, you're, you're thinking receptions, points per reception. And with, with Chubb losing that source almost, it, it's definitely getting people off of his ex expected ownerships right around 12% 
right now. So the, the seventh highest on the slate, but still definitely low for a guy who could go 150, two, three touchdowns. He's still monopolizing that early down work. He's still playing right around 75, 80% of the snaps, even with Hunt often sharing that backfield. And he's still definitely locked in to that goal line role, almost 100% of snaps when they get in there. And I agree with you, like at some point between him, between also Leonard Fournette, like those touchdowns are going to come. And I think this week, especially against Miami, giving up, you know, what is a fifth, third, most, whatever, something right in that top five, two running backs, especially in terms of scores. Uh, it's a great play. I really think at 8,100, that's going to be a big pivot for a lot of people trying to get away from the, the chalk of Alvin Kamara. That's the guy I personally love. 8,200, that Carolina smash spot. I, I mean, it's just what else to say? 32nd uh, ranked DVOA against the run, giving up, I think, like 18 touchdowns on the ground right now. And it's just ridiculous. Running backs are averaging over 30 points as a position against them. The only thing that has me a little bit hesitant on smashing that button and a reason you might want to not eat the chalk, I heard Scott Barrett on a podcast this morning talking about, yes, they are horrendous against running backs on the ground, but through the air, I guess they are limiting backs to the fourth fewest points um, in terms of receiving yards, receptions, and all that, which is obviously an enormous part of Alvin Kamara's game. Now, do I think a a talent like Alvin Kamara is going to be limited in any capacity of the game? No. No, and that's why I'm going to smash button that all week. Uh, but ultimately, like the decision I'm coming to a lot of times is, do I have Kamara in at RB1 or do I get Julio Jones in at my wide receiver one? And that's a tough debate because either one of them could go off for 30. Both of them could. Ideally, I can squeeze them both in there somehow. Uh, that's a decision I'm often facing myself with right now. So we'll, we'll see what ends up coming out of that. Uh, but I love Kamara this week. What do you think about him, Jimmy? I'm also big on Kamara this week. Um, like you said, Smash spot against the Panthers. I, hearing that uh, passing game stats, though, how they could limit him in the passing game, that makes me a little cautious. But, you know, I'm not too worried about playing Kamara this week. I, I, I feel pretty confident using him. Yeah, absolutely. If, in that type of flow, seemingly, if there's ever such thing as a Latavius Murray game, might favor the big back. I was hoping to see him a little cheaper, though. He's still 6,100 on DraftKings. I was hoping yeah. to find him in that 5K, you know, right around where Kareem Hunt and some of those guys are living. But nope, he, he's still in the 6,000 range. His ownership is going to be, you know, 1%. And could he end up being the guy that gets two to three touchdowns? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. So you, you look at that differentiation. It's still, I, I can't stomach putting him in my lineup at that price despite that type of upside there. Uh, moving on to the middle range, as we, we highlight that, who are some guys under 7K uh, that you love this week, Jimmy? I kind of like Joe Mixon. Uh, he's been a staple in my article for the last couple of weeks. And, you know, last three games, 17, 20, and 17. Um, we, we've known the talent's been there. It's just a matter of the offense just sucking. And, like, Andy Dalton couldn't do anything. And, I mean, they're still not great, but I feel like, with Finley and a quarterback, they've kind of opened up the offense for Mixon. They're making him the focal point. They're getting him involved. You know, he's really producing, too. And he's only – he's rushed in a touchdown last week. He caught a uh, touchdown three weeks ago. So, you know, he's he's still finding the end zone. He's getting a lot of usage. And um, his receiving uh, work's only going to help him. At home against Pittsburgh, you know, those two teams hate each other. Hard fought in those battle. I kind of like Mixon. He's still pretty cheap at 59. Is cheap, and yeah, as you cited, those those points these last few weeks have been impressive. It seems to me that they've like officially accepted that fate of we're tanking, let's get in, let's get home, let's feed Mixon 25 times and just kind of get this clock churning, even when we're down. I mean, two weeks ago they were down by like 10 scores, and they still ran 33 times with Mixon. So I, I like that. I am nervous about that defensive line of, of Pittsburgh just absolutely manhandling them and this being just a, a zero-point like just nonsense game for the Bengals, which has me a little nervous on Mixon. Um, and in terms of under 7K, it feels almost like cheating, but Derrick Henry is 6,900, oh, yeah. which is just insane to me. It's kind of like Josh Jacobs a couple weeks ago where it was like, how is this guy under 7,000? His last game out against the Chiefs, he was in the millionaire lineup, had over 30 DraftKings points. And I, I and a lot of people projecting him to still be low-owned because we talked about with almost like Nick Chubb. This is like the lesser version of that, but not a whole lot of receiving upside with Henry. That doesn't mean the guy can't go for 150 and two scores. And he has the Jaguars number, as we saw on Thursday Night Football last year. 
year. Uh, this is the team with the third worst DVOA. Marlon Mack got like 100 yards in the first half before going down. And then you saw Jonathan Williams put up 116, whoever the fuck that is, on 13 carries. So, I mean, if Jonathan Williams and Marlon Mack can combine for 230-something uh, yards, then Derrick Henry could definitely get close to hitting that number just on his own. And he's been sneaky involved in the screen game. He seems to bowl people over and just like score a random receiving touchdown every couple games. Wouldn't be shocked to see that as well. So I, I love having Marlon, uh, um, you know, Derrick Henry alongside Alvin Kamara to st- start my running backfield. Uh, and there's a lot of middle range wide receivers that make that happen. And, and looking at a lot of these lineups that have won, a lot of them do stack two monster backs and find those middle range guys. I mean, last week, John Brown, Calvin Ridley, in terms of wide receivers, uh, you find those guys that afford you that flexibility to get these huge guns. Are you, uh, before we move on to the, the low cost guys that really could get us some flexibility, Christian McCaffrey still 10500 That's got to be the, one of the first questions we always ask ourselves with lineups. Are you going to be paying up? Are you going to be going with uh, Christian McCaffrey? What are your thoughts on him this week? Uh, it's tough because at the running back spot, I, there's not a lot of people that I love. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to lock him in and just know, okay, I'm good for at least 20 points this week for McCaffrey and then I just figure it out from there. I think 20, I think I don't think he's been below 26. I think it's like his low on the season other than yeah. one game against the Bucks. Like it's insanity. So basically like it'll I'll just start basically with McCaffrey and Derrick Henry and I'll just I'll work from there. Yeah. It's I I'm in a similar position. The only thing is like Against New Orleans, they have been so good, similar to the Bucks in a way, which is surprising for two pretty bad defenses as a whole. They have limited running backs really well, and and when McCaffrey's had duds, it has come against the Bucks. It's come against teams that are predictably, and when I say dud, again, like 25 points for him, it's a dud. But when you're paying that much money, it's like you really want to hit 30 or more. I don't know if he gets that against the Saints uh, th- this week. So I'm on the, the Kamara train. I think Kamara can match whatever CMC does on the other side of the ball, but for seventeen or uh, 2700 rather, uh, dollars cheaper. So I'm leaning him. It is such a risky bet because he's going to be McCaffrey right around 25 30% owned. He's probably going to hit 30 points as he always does. Uh, but to me, I just I like the flexibility and what my receiving core ends up looking like when I go Kamara instead of uh, McCaffrey. But if you do go McCaffrey, you're going to need some cheap options. You're going to have to have a couple under 5K guys at running back and probably at wide receiver, certainly at tight end. Who's a couple running backs you could look at if you need that lineup flexibility here? Uh, you know, Derrick Henry Jr. You got Bo Scarborough over in Detroit. <laughs> uh, 4,200. You know, he got 14 carries last week, 55 yards and a touchdown. He's really the only lead back they have there in Detroit. All the other guys seem to be pass catchers or, like, not true, like, workhorses that you can rely on. And Bo really looked like he could be that guy. I mean, the dude's massive. Mm-hmm. He definitely fits the bill of a um, an early down back. So I like the matchup with uh, Washington. I feel like, you know, he's going to get 15-ish carries again this week. They're going to be favored, I would assume. So, you know, that's a positive game script for them where they're just going to be feeding him the ball more often. I feel like he's... He is definitely risky, but I like balancing him out with like a McCaffrey or Kamara. You got to find those cheap options. I feel like he's a decent op- uh, option there for you. Hundred percent. That was the guy you stole him right from me. Uh, and and Jimbo, the guy we're recording with right now, he actually made one an incredible spreadsheet. I tweeted it out today. Uh, some some pictures of it. But Bo was the one in terms of uh, the spreadsheet. Kind of highlights what my personal ranking is for the week versus what their DraftKings price is. I have Bo right around RB twenty three. Uh, that's for a half PPR ranking, so it's a little bit skewed. Uh, PPR might be you know RB twenty six, twenty seven range. I should make sure to adjust that next week. But still, you know, twenty five spots higher his. DraftKings price was the 48th priced running back. Uh, so that's a 25 difference right there, that's highlighting nice. you know how much I like him as compared to what his price is because everything you just said, positive game script, all he really needs is one touchdown and about 60 yards to pay off yep. that 4200 yep. price. And and the, the the Washington Redskins are giving up the fifth most rushing yards uh, per, per game on the ground. So I, I really like Bo Scarborough at 4,200. There's a lot of intriguing options if you don't trust him, if you don't like him. I know our guy, uh, Rich Zenos, who's actually just came out today, was ranked as the 29th player in the world for DFS, which is pretty insane. Uh, so Uh-oh. the kid is crushing it, yeah. That's Having a huge football season. Um, so congrats on that, Zenos, if you're tuned in and listening. I know sometimes you tune in. He, I showed him my first lineup. He 
hasn't made his yet, but he was like, Bo Scarbo, are you shitting me? So, you know, some big guns aren't on him. I still think he could pay off, but some other guys you could look at if not going to Bo. Uh, Geis is 4,700 facing Detroit on the other side of the ball, giving up the most points to running back. So that that could be a reason, you know, Bo doesn't pan out is because Geis gets rolling early and then the game script doesn't favor him. That's the one reason I'd be nervous about Bo is if, if we get a Geis game 45-yard receiving touchdown last week. I actually really like it. You know, if I'm going cheap and stacking this game, Chris Thompson's only 3,800 and he's a PPR uh, machine there. So I really like uh, Chris Thompson. You know, he's been right around the RB10 and RB12 the last couple of years, went on the field for the games. He's active. Uh, he's average points per game that. And only 3,800. I know it's his first game back. It's a Bill Callahan offense, so completely different. Um, but but could be. And other than that, Cohen is 4,800 and Ronald Jones is 4,800. So those are all the guys that I circled under 5K that I'm looking at. But I'm with you. Uh, Bo's my personal favorite at 4,200. Can really get you some lineup flexibility. Um, in, in terms of chalky, was there anyone else you wanted to highlight in the low price range, or are those are the, the kind of the big names there? That's yeah, pretty. You pretty much covered them all. Yeah, uh, I don't like getting down into this territory here. It's I'm tough. Yeah, this is like the flex where you're you're just tossing one in. One yeah. guy we didn't mention. He doesn't cross. He, you know, just above. Uh, 5K, but I want to make sure I do mention Philip Lindsay. He's only 5,200. He's been in some millionaire lineups before. I had like a 30 point week earlier in the season. For six straight weeks, he was out snapped by Royce Freeman. It was gross. It became disgusting. You just definitely could not toss in Lindsay. His price was right in the 6K range. He's down to the, the lowest price he's been since like week two, 5,200. After playing a season high in snaps, seeing a season high in carries. And Buffalo has this reputation as this tough, hard nosed D. But in terms of running backs, they, they rank sixth worst in DVOA, two running backs. Uh, they, they've been very generous to the position as a whole. So at 5,200, I wouldn't be shocked if Lindsay's in that millionaire maker lineup again this week uh so if you can somehow afford up for your flex there uh, not a bad play at all my opinion is philip Lindsay. wanted to make sure i shouted him out let's move on to wide receivers though because as i said you know it used to be running backs only that's how you had to stack at three running backs but right now you know a lot of these winning lineups have four wide receivers you start three and then the flex um so who are some guys you're paying up for this week jimbo I i love this wide receiver slate i'm intrigued to hear who you have the two guys I'm going back and forth over are Julio and Odell right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and they both seem like they're due for massive eruption games. Julio hasn't scored since week three. Um, it's been far too long. You know, it's like the proverbial Mount St. Julio volcano eruption spot mm-hmm. where he rips off like a 30 point game. And, you know, it's against the Bucks who, you know, were, they're great at the run defense, but, you know, awful against the pass. Um, Matt Ryan and the offense looks fine like they have all year. So this could be very much be a Julio spot. And then with Odell, same thing. He's only scored once this year. Um, you know, you play Miami, that's a cake matchup. And a little note under Beckham, I just saw he was limited in Thursday's practice, which doesn't help. Mm-hmm. But uh, Miami is bringing in two new safeties, on star- or starting two new safeties, which is great to hear. And I can just it's been a while since we've seen one of those like 80-yard Odell Beckham slants over the middle where he just takes it and outruns everyone to the end zone. And I just I can feel one of those coming. Mm-hmm. It's like this is the game where it's like he's gonna reintroduce himself to the league and be like, this is what you expected to see all year. You know, it just happens to be against one of the worst teams ever. And then he'll probably fade away into dust the rest of the year. But if he's ever gonna have his one shot to do anything, it's right right now. I love the play. Uh, Seven thousand bucks for Odell. Um, if you, again, at the beginning of the season when everyone was ranking him as a top three, four wide receiver, as as was I, you would never imagine you could get a talent like that at seven thousand bucks on DraftKings. We've seen him make weeks uh, with you know thirty, forty point days. You don't find that often at seven K. So I, I'm totally with you. I can see those slants. You know, Miami's horrible at tackling, um, and they give up tons of huge plays. So that this could be the blow up. I think a lot of people will be on him for that, as they will be. Julio Jones, in terms of projected ownership, uh, those are two of the top three right there. Julio the most at 23%, and Odell third at 16%. But even still, uh, it, it might be some chalk worth eating. I'm, I'm totally with you there. Um, other than them, Michael Thomas, the third highest projected, definitely the highest uh, price at 93 
And, you know, I'm, I'm fading that myself personally. James Bradbury's expected back. And last year, Thomas didn't score a touchdown against the Panthers. He was actually under 50 yards in both games. Now, this is a different offense. This is a different Thomas. Like, you, you can't compare him. It's apples and oranges. But Bradbury has played him well. Uh, so I wouldn't be shocked, again, if this is more of a Kamara-style game. And he's the one eating up those receptions. So I, I am fading Thomas. In fact, I'm kind of fading all these expensive receivers. If I do pay up, it's the two guys you already cited. Um, and I do love the Bucks guys against Atlanta as well. That's we talked about game stacks could yeah. totally be a, a back and forth battle. That's the highest over under at over fifty one and a half right now. And I wouldn't be shocked to see them smash it. I am nervous. Like Atlanta suddenly has a pulse on defense. Like wh- where the fuck did this come from? Out of nowhere. It, it's disgusting. I Dan Quinn gave up play calling responsibilities, and suddenly, I mean, it just goes to show how fucking horrible he is. <laughs> There's um, really something about Dan Quinn. Yeah, it's such a fucking joke, dude. Uh, but ultimately, I'm actually more intrigued, and I have a lot of guys uh, listed in this kind of middle, like, 5 to 7K, mostly in the $6,000 range. There's tons of guys. I'm just going to throw a list out at you that, that I have pretty much locked into all my lineups. It's it's DJ Chark, 6,400. To me, that's my lock of the week. There's nobody else I'm looking more at. I am shocked that he's, like, you know, bottom 20 in terms of ownership percentages because – uh, you know, only at 6% owned right now they're projecting. I, it's a top five receiver right now in fantasy football in a, an unbelievable matchup uh, because Tennessee, you know, down Malcolm Butler, just their secondary is horrendous now. They they already were pretty bad even with Butler. They lose their top corner. Uh, I think Chark's going to just absolutely smash. He's in, there, there's that whole worry, oh, he's going to still get it done with Foles. He's only Minshew's boy. Season high in targets last week, 15. I don't understand why Chark is 6,400. I am hitting that button all day. And right below him, Jamison Crowder, only 6,200. I know, you know, people are getting used to him being in the 57, 58 range. And you see him finally jump into 6K. It's still well worth it, in my opinion. He's the number one scoring wide receiver over the last three weeks. He's been 75 TD in five catches or more in all his last three games. Just the bona fide picture of consistency. I still love him uh, facing the worst team at defending the slot outside of Pittsburgh uh, in terms of Oakland. So I love Crowder. Some other guys in that range, too. You know, Calvin Ridley, 6,500 if you're not going Julio. Landry, 6,300. Um, Tyrell Williams, 5,900 against the Jets, who are the second worst against wider series. And DJ Moore seems to get you know three straight games of double-digit targets. He's only at 6,400. Any of those names, uh, I guess I got to shout out Devontae Parker, too, 5,200, um, as the cheapest of those all those options. Do you have any of those guys? Uh, again, uh, just to tell you, Chark, Crowder, Moore, Williams, Parker, Ridley, Landry. Are those any middle-range guys you're looking at, too? I know I went on for a little bit of a tangent there, but... I love all those guys. Any any ones that strike your interest more than others? Oh, I love Crowder this week. Um, I've loved him a lot this year, especially when Darnold under center. He just seems to like have like a tunnel vision for uh, for Crowder this year, mm-hmm. which is great. Uh, you know, he's getting high target numbers. He got five catches and at least seventy five yards and a touchdown in his last three games. They're playing against Oakland, who has a terrible secondary. I just all the stars are aligning again for Crowder, and it should be another. You know, twenty-ish point performance game from for sixty-two hundred, absolutely. Do you buy the? Uh, I know you love Odell Beckham, but do you buy Landry revenge game here against Miami? Ooh, ooh, yeah, that's something to consider. I know Th- a touchdown in three yeah. straight. Uh, I don't know. He's gonna go hard. You know, he's gonna go hard against his that's former true. team. I guess it's not the same <laughs> coach anymore. <laughs> Off of Odell. Yeah, that's the only thing you got to be worried about. Uh, so I, I like him at 6,300. It's just so tough to navigate. Personally, right now, I end up having uh, Crowder, Chark, and, and uh, Ridley as my three receivers. I'm not paying up for any of the big names, but I, I feel like any of those three, in fact, all three could just hit 25, 30 um, at, at a fraction of the price and lets me get some of that running back flexibility that, I, that you always crave. Um, so that's what I have going in. But if I was going to get a McCaffrey, that means I obviously have to cut one of those guys and go down in price. Are there any cheap guys that, that I can save up so that way I can, can get a McCaffrey in my lineup? One guy that intrigues me is uh, Taylor Gabriel, 4,200. Mm. Um, I like that he's playing at home against the Giants. The Giants' defense is bad. Their secondary is poor. And Gabriel's the guy you know that can get you deep. Um, a nice tournament play. High yardage, a touch, uh, long touchdown. He's got double-digit points in back-to-back games. The real question is, is who's going to be showing up at quarterback? Yeah. 
if, if they can get him the ball, I feel like it's a great matchup, but it's a big if in the beginning there with the quarterback. I love that call, though. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about my own lineup right now. I have Bo at my flex at 4,200, but, I, I mean, again, some of these DraftKings winners have had uh, the, that, you know, wide receiver flex, and Gabriel is an intriguing option. I mean, he had a three-touchdown day on Monday Night Football not all that long ago, so in terms of getting all the way over the edge, like Scarbo might get me 60 in a TD, but he's not going to be a guy that ends up blowing up for 30. Gabriel does, you know, theoretically have that ceiling, and this is the, the second lowest graded secondary by Pro Football Focus. The Giants have one of the worst collection of corners, and I, I've wanted to figure out a way to get some exposure into, you know, the, you know, if anybody facing the Giants is always a decent play. But I don't ever want Trubisky in my lineup because he's fucking nope. horrendous. Oh. Allen Robinson, 6,500, which is just too much in terms of all these other guys I just listed and ranted about. I can't put him in over those guys, was, again, with Mitch Trubisky. But Gabriel, maybe, just maybe, that, you know, two touchdown day from this guy gets deep on that defense twice. That would not surprise me. Jimbo, I like that one a lot. It's a very intriguing, uh, cheap play. Other guys that I have under 5K, I got Alshon at 4,900. That kind of seems like just a couple of weeks ago when we were like Mixon was 4,800. And just like it's mm-hmm. a big name at a low price and not a bad matchup against the Seattle secondary, you know, the right middle of the pack. And that's going to be the shootout I think it's going to be. I wouldn't be surprised to see Alshon hit 70 in a, a TD or so. Um, Randall Cobb's got 100 and, and a TD in two straight. I get that the Patriots are a much tougher defense than anyone he's been facing, but... When you're the third, you get that benefit of third coverage as the, the third option in the offense. And Cobb's been eating it right now. And, and him and Dak had this nice rapport going on. So at 4,800, you know, if he hits another 100 in TD, that's a, a money move. And I really like Renfro, uh, Hunter Renfro for, for Oakland here. The, we raved about how bad the Oakland secondary is for Jamison Crowder. That could be one of those sneaky shoots. There's not a ton of games you look at this week with over-unders that really, really intrigue you. I already mentioned, obviously, Atlanta and the uh, versus the Bucks. You know that's going to be a monster shootout potentially. I wouldn't be surprised to see the second highest being this Oakland uh, Jets matchup here, and I could see Renfro finally finding the end zone. He's been a steady source of receptions and targets, actually the most uh, since their bye, if I'm not mistaken, the most receptions, targets, and yards. Hasn't been finding the end zone. He probably won't often because of his size and stature, but the Jets are horrendous all over the field, and if that's going to be the shootout I expect, uh, a Renfro-Crowder game stack right there, I would not be surprised if that pays out decent. Um, All right, in terms of chalk, I actually forgot to go running back, so let me just rewind real quick. Uh, They expect Bell, actually, to be the highest-owned running back of the week, 24%. Uh, I get the six point four, you know, price tag there, but I don't know. It's to me, it's Bell just hasn't been getting anything going on that awful team. Uh, Kamara is the second highest at twenty two percent. McCaffrey only eighteen percent. He's always in you know, twenty five thirty, so I'm not really buying that. Derek Henry uh, fourth at sixteen, and then Miles Sanders fifth at thirteen and a half. Chubb, Carson, Barkley, Zeke coming in right below him um, in terms of running back ownership, and then at wide receiver Julio twenty three percent. Mike Thomas, 20. Odell Beckham, uh, 16. Mike Evans, 14. And I didn't even consider this one intriguing a little bit here, though. Uh, Nikhil Harry, 3.3 against Dallas. He wasn't even on my radar, but now that that pops up, it's like Sanu might be out, Dorsett might be out. Like, I don't know. What are are your thoughts on any of those guys, including uh, Nikhil Harry here? Harry's definitely interesting. I don't think I'd pull the trigger on that one. It's a little much. Yeah. Uh, if anything, I'd re- reach for Edelman. I feel like Brady's not really going to trust Harry that much yet, and he's probably just going to pepper Edelman 15 times against the Cowboys. I'm glad you mentioned Edelman. I'm, I was surprised neither of us actually had him in our ranks, and I have to bump him up. Um, with I, you know, In my rankings, he's a lot lower than I originally intended him to be, especially with news that Sanu and possibly Dorsett as well are going to be out. You're right. He's going to probably see 15, 16 targets. I am significantly lower on him. He's only 6,900 this yeah. week as well. So, I mean, a lot of times that is the difference between him versus Odell. But if it goes the way the season's been going, that, that's the thing with, like, Chark, right? He's been outplaying Odell all year, and you get him for 600 cheaper. I wouldn't be surprised to see everyone, you know, flocking to get Odell, and Chark flies on the radar and has yet another 30-point day. Uh, that everyone was hoping for Odell, and then you just get your usual 70, you know, six catch day. Um, I, I wouldn't be shocked by that. I, I wish I had, I didn't go through some of the guys too in terms of that spreadsheet you made, the biggest gaps in terms of bargains. 
I had uh, Chark 10 spots higher than his DraftKings price. Uh, Crowder 14 spots, who I raved about. And Devontae Parker actually 19, a uh, whopping 19 spots higher at 52. He's the 38th price DraftKings receiver, which to me just makes no sense because he's been double digits in eight straight weeks. He just got 135 on Tredavious White. Like the matchup's not great against Cleveland, but especially if they're going to blow up like you think they are. Game flow should favor Parker. His first game without Preston Williams sets the uh, season high in targets and catches uh, and yards. I don't know. 5,200 seems a little bit cheap for him. Do you, do you have, are you disgusted by Parker? Could you even let him in your lineup? What do you think? No, I mean, he's played really well this year, so I, I could easily see fitting him into my lineup if necessary. Um, and he's been reliable. So. Yeah, Hard to hate, especially when you put up twenty three and a half against Buffalo, that's pretty impressive. Not bad at all. Zeno's had him in there too. Won some some good money because of that. Uh, and in terms of like the opposite side, some guys that I'm I'm lower on than their DraftKings price. John Brown, I'm seventeen spots lower. He's the tenth highest uh, priced wide receiver, and I have him at twenty seven this week. I just don't love that Denver matchup. And Galladay, uh, the twelfth highest price, I have him sixteen spots lower at twenty eight. I mean Driscoll does just hum it. And, and throw up, you know, prayers and call. They certainly can come down with them, but I just don't know whether it's going to be him or Jones. So those are a couple guys I'm fading this week. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that ends up going. Tight end, very strange slate for tight ends. There's really not a whole hell of a lot out there, especially with Kittle on Sunday Night Football and maybe not even playing at all. Uh, there's really one guy, if you're going to pay up, you're probably going to go for, and that's Zach Ertz. Yeah. So the question is, are you paying up for Ertz? Are you getting him in your lineups? What do you think? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to be able to fit him in with all the studs at running back and receiver. Um, I can't really justify paying up for Earth unless I go very off the grid, but probably too much. There are, there are a couple guys that are cheaper that I like. Yeah, I mean, Ertz has gotten 11 targets in back-to-back games, so... But that was with Alshon Jeffrey out. So with him returning, I just don't see it being, you know, I can't justify the price, especially when my favorite play of the week, uh, Dallas Goddard on the same team, is, you know, $3,000 cheaper or whatever it might be. He's the 16th priced guy on DraftKings, my 7th ranked tight end of the week. He's got a touchdown in three of his last four. He's not racking up yards. You're not going to ever hit that 100-yard bonus for, for yards with Goddard or anything. But one to two touchdowns against a Seattle team that's given up the seventh most of the position. I really like Goddard. Is there any tight ends you're looking at? You said you're not paying up. So who are a couple names you have circled that you, you're finding in your lineup quite often? I'm a little intrigued by Vance McDonald, 3,500. Oh, uh, come on. I, I'll I, well, let you go, but Jesus Christ. It, it's not great at first. He's got <laughs> seven targets in three straight games. And you think about it, um, Pittsburgh's missing Connor. They're going to be missing Juju. And then I believe it was Deontay Johnson. He's limited at practice, but he was the guy that I'm pretty sure was bleeding out of his ear yep. after his absolutely molly walk. So I don't know how he's going to play. No. So that, there's like almost no skill position guys left in Pittsburgh. Um, they're kind of like scrapping and scraping the ball in the barrel here. So, you know, it could lead to more targets for Vance. Uh, it's kind of a shot in the dark, but, you know, when desperate times call, desperate measures. <laughs> And it is against since you know you make a you make a decent case. You, you got me on Gabriel thinking about him. Maybe I don't know. I, I can't see myself <laughs> getting swayed on Vance. It's only two hundred more bucks to get to uh, Goddard, and to me, I just I really like Goddard's spot. Um, uh, another guy that I'm intrigued by. If I'm going down, down, down to like the bottom of the barrel. I kind of like Ben Watson. I think he's, what, 2,800 this week. And with all these pass-catching options banged up, uh, last week we saw four or five catches. I forget the exact stat line. But Watson seemed pretty active. He was in there for most of the snaps. And now gets a Dallas team that's given up the fifth most points to tight ends and very limiting to pretty much every other position. So I wouldn't be surprised if Watson, find, Watson finds pay dirt, also hauls in four or five catches and just for, for the bottom barrel price, that's a guy that could definitely pan out, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, Ryan Griffin, is he for real? What are, you, what are your thoughts on him against this Oakland? If that's a shootout-style game like we think it could be, you think Griffin finds the end zone this week? He seems to have, he seems to have a nose for the end zone, that's for sure. Um, he's definitely got chemistry with Darnold. Like we said, Oakland, not a great secondary team you can throw on. Uh, aside from one dud he had against the Giants in Week 10, games of, let's see, 24, 11, and 25. So, yeah. He's been putting it up, and he's looked pretty good. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 could easily, I could easily go with him or, uh, him or Goddard in that cheaper range. 
Yeah, he's, I think he's what forty two hundred, I believe, is his price this yeah. week. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, t- totally getting it done right now. And Oakland, the, the third most points of tight ends, only Arizona and Tampa Bay are worse, and they're like historically bad this year. So uh, definitely a ripe spot for this guy to continue blowing up. He actually was in the Millionaire Maker lineup last week. That's kind of why I'm liking Watson. It's like he was Griffin was twenty nine hundred last week. So when you can get that guy that's you know under three K that somehow hits twenty. That that's when you end up winning a million, and that's to me what what Watson could end up being uh, this week. In terms, Watson, of, what's that? Watson's, 30, Watson's thirty one this week. Oh, okay, so he's not even under three k. I thought for sure he was like twenty eight hundred. I'm completely mistaken. Thank you for uh, checking my math on that one. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anybody under three k who I do genuinely like this week. Maybe like Rhett Ellison for the Giants if Ingram's out. No, I can't do that. Fuck that. You could go like maybe Moreau and hope that like Darren Waller is like a decoy or something and they just right. never kill him. Nah, no. It's I'll st- like- I'll stick to Goddard. I have Goddard locked in. He's gonna he's gonna catch at least one touchdown. I think he's going for two, uh, personally. What about defenses? Are you paying up this week? Are you doing the usual, you know, punt it and just hope for the best at a cheap guy? Who well, are some guys you, you got on the list for defense this week? A quarterback. Quarterbacks? Oh, yeah. did we just completely skip quarterbacks? Yeah, that's probably a little important, a little more important than defense. My fault. I was looking at the spreadsheet, and I just assumed I had already gone through them. So, yes, thank you, Jimbo, for calling my attention to uh, the signal callers here. What are, what are the quarterbacks you like? If you're paying up at the position, who are you going the, the premium price on? Oh, Matt Ryan. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you choose Matt Ryan, anytime I choose Julio, it always goes to Calvin Ridley. So when I draft Matt Ryan... I, it doesn't matter who he throws to. As long as he throws to someone. Um, and we know Tampa's run defense is great. Brian Hill stinks. Fuck him. He hates fantasy football. He's such a douche. So he's going to suck on the ground. So he's not going to be able to do anything um, except for throwing the ball through the air. So Matt Ryan, 19 last week, 15 the week before. I think he gets back into that like mid-20 to 30 range here against Tampa. I'm giving up the most passing yards in the league. Uh, right around the most p- passing touchdowns in the league, too. Yeah, it's never a bad idea to target um, a, a Jameis Winston uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers team, especially because they can generally keep it competitive, too. So they got to keep the air uh, under the rock. Uh, so it's, it's not usually blowouts there. So, yeah, nothing but love for Matt Ryan. I, I would even say, you know, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley stack isn't the worst of ideas. Uh, a lot of these winning lineups end up having two to three of the pass catchers. Uh, Golden Tate and Darius Slayton was in a winning lineup just a few weeks ago. Uh, so, yeah, that that could be the play there. This is certainly the defense, especially with Hooper now knocked out. It's very concentrated as to who that, you know, it's going to be 350 yards and three touchdowns. And I can't really imagine, other than those two wide receivers, who's going to be hauling that in. Maybe Russell Gage finds a cheap fucking score at 3 9. Uh, mm-hmm. But still, like, that's the 80% of whatever Matt Ryan does is probably going to be going to Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones. And I think he's going to, like you said, do a, a whole hell of a lot. So I love that if I'm paying up. I don't generally pay up at quarterback, though. Um, that's where I you know, save my money so I can get my McCaffreys, Kamaras, stack those skill positions. Um, and I just try to find that cheap quarterback play. And this week, I, it's a great slate for cheap plays. My personal favorites, uh, it's a tie right now uh, between Carson Wentz, who's the 18th price quarterback, but the 8th quarterback in my ranking. Uh, he's he's 54. Four, no, 5,600 on DraftKings. And I also love big dick Nick Foles, uh, especially since Chark's lined up in my, you know, a lock in my lineups. I wouldn't be shocked if this is that Nick Foles, you know, every year seems to have that four to five touchdown day. And I just think this Tennessee defense, they're already bad in terms of their ranking, but they've only had one game without Malcolm Butler. Granted, yes, it was against Pat Mahomes, uh, but still, they you know gave up, what, 40-something points, over 400 passing yards, and Foles can sling that rock deep. So, you know, my 12th-ranked quarterback, but 22 in terms of DraftKings prices. So I love Wentz at 56. I love Foles at uh, 5,400. Who are some cheap guys beyond them that you might be looking at, Jimbo? I like a guy right in between. Uh, Jeff Driscoll, 5,500. Nice. They're letting him sling the ball around, and, you know, he's got 19 and 27 points in his two games. Um, the thing that I love about him is he uses his legs. Yeah. So he's getting those cheap points for you on the ground. Uh, game against Washington, I, that's a good matchup there. You know, he's got the talent at receiver with uh, Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones. So I think Driscoll could still be a sneaky good play at 55. I'm not, I'm not hating it. What are your thoughts? 
I know you said you like Odell. We both said the Landry, you know, revenge game could be a big one. Do you have Baker going in any lineups? Are you ready to trust this guy? Oh, yeah. I'll have Baker going in lineups, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think a lot of people are mortal locking him. Uh, he's Ma- probably, I'd say he's got to be a top three chalk player this week. I, I yeah, he's oh. right up there. Let me pull up the quarterback chalk here. I just had it up. Uh, he's actually fourth right now at 10%, Ooh. but I, I, I think he'll be, right like you said, uh, top 10. Matt Ryan, the guy we, we just sucked off, he's 14 and a half. Uh, Carson Wentz, 12.4. Jameis Winston at 12.3, so a lot of people targeting that high over under. They're expecting over at Roto Grinders. Baker comes in at third, uh, fourth. I, I'm with you. I expect him to be much closer to top two, three uh, in terms of ownership. And then uh, Russell Wilson, fifth right there. Jeff Driscoll, the guy you just raved about, comes in at six. Um, so my guy down there, Nick Foles, 1.9%. Could be that difference maker if he yeah. ends up hucking you know, f- four touchdowns, which I truly think is within his realm of possibilities. I get the four net whining, and, and to me that seems like it might be a, a squeaky wheel. It gets you know one, two touchdowns, too. But that's the game, you know, we talked about the Jets, Oakland. We talked about the Falcons, Bucks. If, if there's a third game that I'm targeting, I sneaky like the Titans and the Jaguars to kind of put up a lot of points on each other. And it sounds hideous. Like those two teams are known for awful matchups, known for low score and gross affairs. But not this year. Neither defense has anything really going for it. Uh, you know, the, the Titans have a horrible secondary. The Jags have a horrendous run D. I think they're just going to kind of swap scores back and forth. And I, I, again, think Foles could easily go for three, if not four touchdowns at such a low cost and ownership. That's that's my play. That's the Who knows how it's going to pan out. It's gross. He didn't look great last week, but I, I'm a fan of, of Nicky Foles here this week. Um, and my contrarian play... Uh, beyond that, if I'm getting crazy, as you, you're all in on Baker, a lot of people are all in the Browns. I might be tossing in the Miami defense, moving on to defenses, oh. at only $2,000. So the worst, the lowest priced defense of the week. Baker's a fucking idiot. He loves to hand the ball over. At that point, if you get like two turnovers, and especially if one of them somehow goes into the end zone... That Dolphins defense at two thousand bucks would be pay off huge. The amount of flexibility you get would be enormous. So with everybody sucking off the the Browns as much as they are, and granted they could put up seventy points, like they have the firepower, and this defense is bad enough to allow that. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked. So I, I have the Dolphins on cue. The only reason I'm not locking them into all my lineups is the Broncos are only 400 bucks more, and that's a much better defense against a pretty bad offense in yeah. terms of the Buffalo Bills. Uh, in fact, in terms of that spreadsheet we made, um, I have them ranked, the Broncos at my ninth ranked, and the DK price is the 22nd. And, and in terms of pro football focus, they've got the best run defensive grade. They've got the, the fifth best secondary grade. This is a decent defensive unit that's had a couple tough breaks uh, I think against Buffalo, if things bend the right way for him, and as I said, I like Lindsey too. So if you're playing those matchups, you know, bleeding the clock with Lindsey, putting that defense in, I kind of like the the Broncos D at 2400. What are your thoughts on defense this week, Jimbo? You kind of stole my thunder here, going with the the worst defense in the slate because I'm all about <laughs> the second worst defense in the Bengals. Yeah, <laughs> I am. I we touched the uh, we touched upon it earlier with Pittsburgh missing all their skill guys. Right, Mason Rudolph last Thursday night looked like the worst quarterback I've ever seen in my life. That's a good point. He was atrocious. Um, you know, now you get the Bengals and they're at home. And last week they went to Oakland. You, everyone expected Oakland to put up like 30 something points and just blow the game away. And they only scored 17. Mm. And the Bengals had eight drafting points last week. So now you kind of flip the script, bring them home, face them against Rudolph, who stinks. And, you know, he's on the road. So he's going to, I would assume, struggle a little more. And, for only twenty one hundred, I'm I'm finding a hard time not putting in either the Bengals or the Broncos lineup this week. That's actually if it's a hundred bucks more than the Dolphins, it's probably <laughs> worth figuring out a way to save a hundred bucks and getting that Bengals defensive uh, unit in. And, and plus, you got Mason Rudolph just had a helmet smashed off his head, so maybe he's a little woozy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> he already had a humongous head that probably couldn't fit in helmets. Maybe it's swelled up just a little bit. A, you know, a little dinged up like that. Yeah, I can see the Bengals. I wouldn't be shocked if this is like the first Bengals win of the year out of nowhere with a, a stalwart defensive effort. Juju's not going to be in. James Conner's probably out. Uh, if they can just somehow stop 
Jalen Samuels, then then yeah, me, you know, I see it. If I'm gonna go Dolphins, I'm gonna figure out a way to get that hundred bucks. And and there's a lot more appeal to the Bengals, in my opinion. All righty, you've sold me on them. I, I can get in with that yeah. uh, for sure. All righty, Jimbo. Any other you know players we didn't talk about? Any sleepers or any big predictions before we get out of here? I think we cover them all. We did a good job. Nice. Uh, the only player I forgot to mention when we're going over wide receivers, just because he's literally the w- lowest flat dead K three thousand, uh, you know, as cheap as can be. Tim Patrick didn't look horrible in his return to the lineup. Had eight targets, seven catches, like at three thousand bucks. Again, if you're looking for just complete bargain barrel, uh, that's just a guy I wanted to end up mentioning. Um, don't hate him at all. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other last players to go. No, that's probably just about it uh, for me. So, folks, thanks so much for for tuning in to our daily fantasy podcast recorded every Thursday. Video comes up on Thursday on Facebook and YouTube. The podcast drops on Friday. So hopefully we help you win some money. Hopefully we get back into the green on our tournaments. Um, I I feel great about this slate, as I always do. So I'm I'm looking forward to bouncing back and rebounding. And and on next Thursday, you'll be talking to a millionaire, Jimbo. As long as I get a cut of that, I'm happy. Hell yeah. All right, brother. Best of luck with your lineups, and uh, and have a great week 12. Yeah.